Okay, so it's recording now. If you want to speak and you don't want to be recorded, just raise your hand and then I'll mute the microphone. Let's go for it. We start with the uh, attention. Yeah. So the two uh, blocks that we will cover today, attention and transformer, you see they are very tightly related. Um, they are, it could be one single block. Okay. Also, if you want my last year lecture in Catalan, you have it here as well. So, and also, you have a session lectures by Amaya Salvador. And Marta Ruiz on the same topic. This is the outline that uh, will follow, and you see that I will start motivating uh, attention mechanisms as a comparison to recurrent neural networks. So you must try to remember what we did in recurrent neural networks. You had a session, you had a lab. I will still, anyway, now review it. And let's start by trying to motivate attention. So the idea of attention mechanisms is um, to facilitate the network or the networks to focus on some parts of the input. Or, yeah, let's see, some parts of the input. And, and later you see that also some parts of the output. But no, maybe now it's a bit too strange. Okay, so imagine that classic problem in deep learning where we have a, an image and you want to classify that image, image, assign a label. And in general, as so far, what we have seen, what we will do is we have this. Convolutional neural network, we have the convolutional filters that they will apply all locations on the input image in the same way. And all locations in the input image, uh, they contribute in the same manner to the final prediction, which in this case, that would be uh, an output of the softmax. So the idea is to, our goal will be to um, allow the neural network to focus on some parts of the input that might be more relevant for a prediction. And by doing that, the prediction will be more robust and confident. So in order to explain the uh, attention, I will use a study case, but that it doesn't mean that attention is only useful for this study case. Fine. So I will start with this study case, which, is, which are sec to sec models. Maybe you have seen them somewhere. Maybe you haven't. Have you seen this sec to sec in language? course, I guess. So the idea of uh, sec to sec models that were proposed in the, especially in the field of uh, machine translation, is that we are going to have a neural network or layer, that's all a layer. You can think that is a, a recurrent layer, and we fit into this layer a sequence of tokens, of input tokens. And once we have finished feeding into the, this layer, this sequence of tokens, we feed a, a special token that we define. And it's one combination of zero or one, one cutting column, which is special for this token, which means go, which means from now on, I expect you to predict the output sequence that corresponds to the input sequence that I show you. After doing that, the next were in this case, a single layer will predict an output token. And this output token, in general, we will adopt an autoregressive approach, which means that the output at this point is fed as an input in the next time step. And then the output is fed in the input, and so on and so on, until the model decides that the output sequence has finished. In this case, the model will also issue a special token uh, typically in as EOS would be end of sequence, some special token that will uh, sign out as that we are done, that the, the, the process of going from in one input sequence to the output sequence is, is over, it has finished. Fine. In, pra in practice, so that's the that's concept, in practice, if these are a current network, at this point, there will also be some predictions, but we just ignore them. Okay. Because here there will be a softmax, for example, with all the, in this case there are letters, so all the letters, there will be some output, but we would ignore them, actually. And yeah, I guess that's what they, right? They say to say. 
So CycleSec was, among others, basically uh, pr uh, proposed by Uriol Vinyals, a former UPC student and say, local legend, let's say, now at Google DeepMind. You can watch his talk. He, he presents recurrent neural networks as well as this concept of sec to sec in the context of things, for example, especially of uh, machine translation. You can see here it's written machine translation, so I guess that's what he talks about. Okay. Now, by taking this study case, which is totally based in RNNs, uh, later I will motivate why we want attention mechanisms. So first I will introduce this um, scheme that taken from Stanford University, from Carvalho C and Matthew Long. I think it's very clear. So it, this scheme uh, covers, again, the task of neural machine translation. We have an input uh, source sentence. In French, and these values they are fed into an RNN layer. Notice that here the representation of this RNN is slightly different from what we have seen in the past because now in this representation, let's see, we can see how many neurons there are. Okay, in the past we just saw them also one neuron, it's totally equivalent. Um, so the idea is that we fit the uh, token and the state of the this recurrent layer is fed. In, into itself in the next time step together with uh, the, the next token. Yeah, that's what we saw with RNNs. And if we apply this idea of sequence to sequence, what we do is we fit the, these four sentences, uh, sorry, these four tokens, these four words to the RNN. And at this point, the idea of sequence to sequence models is that the representation, the output of this uh, layer, encodes the whole sequence we have fed. If this is true from this representation, now we can start decoding, which means generating the output sequence. So it, here, the character is called star. I think it was go in the previous example, but just means it's a special token. Uh, then here, the output, there will be, this will be a softmax layer. Okay, it's, there's only an arrow, but you can think there's a softmax layer. It's printing one of the possible output tokens, which will be maybe all the words in English. We take the, it's going to be maybe a softmax output, uh, take the maximum value, and then that will be the, the first word that we, we predict. As, as I explained earlier, as this is an autoregressive approach that he gets fit into input, then another one, and so on and so on. So we, in the end, we, by doing this autoregressive, in the end, we predict the whole translation. And the network, the layer, uses the spatial token N to signal that the sequence is over. Okay, so that's exactly what I explained before, but in a new representation, because now I'm going to use this representation to introduce tension mechanism. Good. Another view of the same story. Uh, now with some animations. We have the that uh, again from French to English, and we can see uh, the relation of the state of the encoder, how it affects the decoder. So notice now we will start. Feed the one word, we have the state fetched into the next uh, token, another state, and that's the hit, this hidden state of the last step of the encoder. That's what we feed to the decoder. Okay. So the important message here is that the decoder only sees the last hidden state of the encoder. Yeah, that's I wanted to emphasize here because later things will change. The decoder is the task of the decoder is only based on the Last hidden set of info. Good. Then, question for you. Um, how does the length of the source sentence, or the length, the amount of tokens in the source sentence, affect the size D? And where by D, I will be this size of its encoding. So, this is a question for you to think about. How do you think that uh, the amount of, of, of words at the input um, may affect the size of the representation? Anybody willing to give an answer being recorded? <laughs> okay, I'll do a visual, visual answer. Do you think that, that the larger the input sequence, the larger the representation is? Just raise your hands if you think. The case. 
Nobody will want to raise their hands. Okay. Do you think that to be okay? Or do you have a question? I'm not sure. Like I have an observation. Like if okay. you want to represent more words, you obviously need more space, but like it's not linearly increasing. So okay. It does affect the little, I think. Okay, I, I think that everything you say is totally correct, but in this special in this specific example, this specific example, okay, where there are in this specific example. Uh, if if I if instead of encoding four words, I encode five or six or seven, how would that affect the size of this representation? That's that's my question. Okay, okay. So I think now everybody says no, so it doesn't increase. Does it decrease the size of the representation? No. But do, who thinks that it's the same size? Okay. Now some some brave people raise their hand. Others never didn't raise their hand anywhere. Right? <laughs> increase, decrease. Um, so. Okay, so there's one answer of this famous linguist, computational linguist, Roy Moni, he said, uh, you can cram the meaning of a full whole sentence into a single vector, which I think was more or less what you were mentioning here, like you, you, you understood that there should be a relation, but uh, you were asking yourself, okay, there's a relation, but I don't really know what type of relation is there. Is it linear? Probably not, but whatever relation is there. Because if, if, if um, if that, if that was, if the case was that, never mind the input length, uh, this representation of four neurons is good enough. Okay. If, if we had enough with a finite dimension of the representation, let's say four neurons, to encode any length of sequence, I mean, that would be kind of a miracle, right? We could put all the information in the world in, in four neurons, which doesn't, doesn't make sense, okay? So there should be some, some relation. That's, that would be one, one approach, or the other approach is, okay, this, this, this doesn't scale. I mean, this approach, great, I mean, great for the people who thought how to use RNNs to do neural machine translation, but has some uh, limitations, okay, because this approach doesn't scale with the size of the input sentence or the input uh, sequence, whatever, how long, how long it is, okay? And one approach would be, maybe we can try to make it larger, uh, okay, I'm not aware of any work who's trying to do that, um, but basically, in general, when we have neural networks, the architecture, in general, it's, it's fixed. The amount of neurons that we have in architecture, that's fixed, and then you deal with that. It's not that you add more neurons when you are, when you are dealing with different problems, which would be having sentences of different length. Okay. So let, let's leave it that there's a problem in this approach. Um, this problem is known as the information bottleneck, which means that, okay, that we, if we are going to capture all the information in this uh, representation, uh, that's problematic because there, it doesn't depend on the, on the length of the input sequence. Okay, so this is a problem that RNNs have when trying to encode any sequence of any length, and now, no few minutes, I will provide a solution for that. Before doing that, I need to introduce or review some terminology that is very, very common in the field of attention mechanism, especially the, the transformer, which are these terms of key query and value. Okay, maybe you have heard about it. If you have fun, don't worry, now I will explain. So, where, so those of you who have, have heard about this concept, where did you hear about them? Which context? Speech. In speech, okay, okay, because you did transformers already in speech, okay. No, leave alone those leave alone those people who already know transformers. Before that, other contexts where the, the terms key query and value are introduced. Yeah, in databases. That database, database, right? That's that's the originally the domain where they um, where they are applied. And the idea is that in the databases, in, in the sense of uh, places where we search for information, we store our information in values in order to access this information, these values, each of them has a key in such a way that, for example, if I have my TDF in my uh, laptop, my uh, hard drive of the laptop, uh, I have a key, which is the file name, and that this allows us a way to find the, the information, the value. So when we want to retrieve information, uh, one way is you, we formulate a query, we compare the query with all the keys, and we take the 
that match that it's the best one, or we create a rank list of, of all the results, and that will be a search engine. Fine. Then what we are going to do in uh, in attention mechanisms is we are going to define the attention, the attention mechanism, uh, different ways, different of them, depending on how we compare the queries and the keys. There are there will going to be different ways to compare that, to assess this similarity. And that's going to define different attention mechanisms. In our setup, let's go back to that example of the of the set to set. Um, we are going to refer to the encoder states of uh, the RNN as key or values. Okay, and this is something that's a bit complex, I mean counterintuitive, but depending on what, on what we do with the with the representations with the encoding states. So when we are doing, we are just assessing the similarity, then we will say that they are the keys. When we are interested in the contents of the, and we manipulate them, let's say, then we will we'll say that the encoder state is the value. On the other hand, in this setup that I was presenting, we are going to compare the keys with the query, and the query is going to be the state of the RNN, so of the same architecture, but when decoding, the sequence. So our queries will be the state of the decoder, the keys will be the state of the encoders, and the values also the state of, of the encoder. Okay, we're going to use this terminology at least in, in this first model. Once introduced this terminology, let's see how we can come up with the problem of the information bottleneck thanks to these attention mechanisms, key queries, and, and values. First, I'll illustrate an illustration that compares to what we have earlier. Just notice what's the difference between this one and the one we saw earlier. Graphically, what's the difference that you can observe? This one sees only states, or the decoding states sees all the states from the encoding state. Exactly. So remember that I was putting so much emphasis saying, hey, in the previous case, without attention, the Decoder only saw the hidden state after the last step of the encoder. Now, notice that in the diagram, the decoder has access to all the hidden states of the encoder, both from the first, after the first token, after the second token, after the third token. That the, the concept is, is this one. Okay. So remember that RNNs, when I presented, they only had access to, to the hidden state on the previous time, time step. That's all. At, at the end, I think that it gave you some advanced examples of some strange RNNs that also had access to two steps or three steps before, but but not to all the steps. That's that's the idea. Okay. Then this idea that's pretty in our uh, diagram. What we're going to do is the following. As we have keys that I said that they are the state of the encoder and query, which is the state of the decoder. And I mentioned that keys and queries, they are useful to compare, to assess similarities. Let's assess similarities somehow. Now I'm not giving you the details. Later, I'll give you details to exactly how we assess the similarity. Let's assume that we have some way to assess the similarity of a query and a key. Okay? And the result of this similarity, we call it attention score. So in this example, we have the state of the decoder at this point, we compare it with the first, the state of the encoder after the first token, and that gives us one attention score. Okay. And we're going to do the same with all the state of each, with comparing all the, the by comparing the query with all the keys. As a result, we have one attention score uh, to each state of the encoder related to that, to that query. Hmm? Then after that, what we're going to do is we're going to add a softmax layer. Remember, the softmax layer is this layer that the concept is that the higher values they become higher, okay, uh, with respect to the lower values. So it kind of pushes higher values up and pushes the rest of values relatively down. Let's say remember there's an exponential. Okay, the result will be an attention distribution 
that we can already give an interpretation in this setup that we're having. We are following this example of neural machine filtration. There are these uh, four words in French, and we are we are starting to translate. Okay, so what the softmax attention distribution is telling us in this specific case is that uh, to start decoding, to start translating, what we should do is mostly attend. So the highest values here mostly attend to the first of the chokers. Okay, so it's yeah. So after doing that, what we do is we are going to and now that we are going to combine the stage of the encoder, weighted by the value of the of their corresponding submax. So at this point, when we are doing this um, weighted average, if you want, you can. Think. To think about that, it's a weighted sum of these values. That's when the state of the encoder is acting as a value, because now uh, we are interested in the content. We are going to work with the content of the encoder. We are, we are multiplying these outputs by each of these of these values, so each corresponding output for each of the value, and do a combination of all of them. So in the end. We still have at the end one vector of dimension four in this setup, this example. But now this vector is combining all the uh, states of the encoder. And if the encoder has four, okay, it's combining four, but it has one million. We have one million um, states of the encoder to combine, but in the end, they would all be collapsed into a single vector of dimension four. So that's kind of the trick to um, be able to handle sequences of any length, because what we do is a, it's a it's a weighted sum of all of them. And in order to find the weights, we combine this, we compare the queries and the keys, and with and with the softmax, that kind of just the normalizing, we have the weights to combine them. I move forward, maybe in the later, maybe you have questions. So now we have this, this, this encoding, we call this the context vector. It's representing um, the input sentence, but not all the input sentence, but the input sentence when we are going to start translating. Okay, it's, it's, it's an encoding of this sentence, but when we are focused, when we are interested, on starting the translation. So based on that, we take this uh, vector. You can you can think it's the same as the, the hidden state of the RNN, the vanilla RNN. We combine it with the state of the of the RNN that we I think we can concatenate them. I think we can concatenate them, and on top we can train a a layer, the softmax that in the end will predict the word. In this case, it takes he which makes sense in this example because the, most of the attention was in the first token, which refers to ill. That's probably all of you know that that's he in French. What would be the next step now after this? The rest is, is exactly the same as what we saw earlier. What's coming now? Use output as input of Excellent. So we have the he, we fill it as the input. There will be going to be a new uh, hidden state. So the decoder, we compare the hidden state, so this query with all the keys. We have a new set of attention scores because now the, we are comparing with this value, not with this. So new set of attention scores, there's a softmax, we normalize. So the value, whatever distribution we have, these are the weights that we use to combine all the state encoders into a single vector. Yep. What is the first uh, query line? What is it representing? This one? Yeah. What is it? So the token you mean? I mean, no. Well, when you like perform the similarity uh, computations with the pure state, okay. like what, you, what are you comparing when you're comparing with the first query? Of the recording stage. So it's what we compare always the 
state of the RNN in this case of the hidden layer. Yeah. Uh, it's, so the, what changes is that the input, instead of being the encoding of mm -hmm. this word, it's one token that we, we will, when we train our network, there's going to be the same way that we have a token for intact there's mm -hmm. going to be a spatial token for star. Okay, so it's like the representation of this token in, in that space. Yeah. Okay. Good. So we would just iterate more and more. And at the end, uh, it should be an end of set sequence that I didn't put here, but we, we would be just translating more and more tokens. And we would have the translation in French to English. Yeah. Um, one way to interpret or to visualize what we have seen is through what's called the attention matrix. The attention matrix provides a visual representation of which input tokens are attending to produce to produce each of the output tokens. Then I have a, a question for you. Okay. So in this example, uh, there is this will be a sequence of input tokens okay, in Spanish, but I'll tell, and the output uh, translation. Uh, are you going to the hotel? And in this, this will be the attention matrix. Then the question is, in this attention matrix, in which direction is the softmax normalization applied over this attention matrix? Uh, across the row or across the columns? Time to think about it. Now that you will stop raising your hands. So the question, the question, and I'm referring to this softmax, this softmax. Here there's a softmax that goes from the detention scores to this distribution. So this softmax, are we applying it to the vertically or horizontal? Okay. Did you think about it? Great. Okay. So let's see how many people think that it's uh, horizontally. I will I will raise my hand in both, okay? I'm not trying to bias it. Great. How many people think that it's uh, vertically? Okay, let me see the answer. It's horizontal. Oh, now I'll elaborate. Okay, yes, I guess many people raise their hand vertical, so that, that wasn't clear at all. I'll try to, to explain again. So the, the soft max, uh, maybe it's clear in this in this plot, uh, it's applied. Uh, over the input tokens okay, in the direction of the input tokens. It's, so the idea is that the output of the softmax across all input tokens, um, as it's the output of softmax, it should add up to one. So maybe that's the one way to also to check that we are we are doing it well. And for example, here if you if you look at the colors, more or less, uh, for example, there's this very large value, okay. If it so first, if it was vertical, there would be two very large values for it that would be more than one. I know it's color coded, but you can think about it. But if you look at it horizontally, uh, there's only one. When there's a, a very dark green, there's only one in each row. But basically, the idea here is that uh, okay, can, can we no, here? Maybe the last one is. One of the tricky case. So when it decodes the question mark, it must attend to this one and this other one. So that's why this green is not as dark as the ones that where it's a unique. It's kind of so so. And and when it focuses in bus, for example, in Spanish, uh, the the person, the verb, if they are all together, they can they can be all together in a, in a single word. So that's why, I mean, if that's something we can see vertically, but actually when, when decoding the softmax layer, we, we, we apply to produce the, the output tokens. So first the, the softmax is over this work and later for going as well into pass this work. Yeah. Is that more clear? I guess there was a bit of confusion here. Yeah. Also, is it because we don't know the how many output tokens we're putting in the path, or we are putting the tokens in the error? Huh? So it's it's normal that the, we analyze it uh, uh, horizontally. 
Okay, I guess it's a yeah, no, that thing is a auto value. I'm thinking I'm thinking if there's any setup where where the length of the input changes, but I guess no. No, okay. Yes. Good. Fine. So now if you remember in all my all my explanation. I said uh, there's some point where we compute the attention scores, and I said that's when we compare the queries and the keys. And the way how we compare them, so the way how queries and keys interact, uh, that's one way to describe attention. So in this tree that you see here, there are different ways of categorizing different types of attention, and one of them is uh, on how we compare the keys and, and the queries. So I'm focused on this. As you can see, there are already like two big families, the additive or concatenated attention and the dot product dish attention. attention. So I, I will first, I will advance that historically, that was the first one that was proposed. Nowadays, most people are using this one. Okay. Okay, and that's why, and wait, okay. it's not, that's why I hate. <laughs> so the slides were hidden, but I think we have are good on China. We can we can see the slides. Okay, but they were hidden because they are not that that not that popular nowadays. But I guess historically it's, it's nice. Okay, so remember the question that we have is how we compute these scores. Okay, as I just said, we compute similarity and then explain how. So I will go through this. The variations, like if attention, multiplicative, and scaled up product. Multiplicative and scaled up product, they are more or less the same, but the literature, because they call it multiplicative, and now they are called scaled up product. But you see that they are the same. Yeah. So let's start with this additive that, were, that was the first one that was proposed. So it goes like this. Um, basically, the first proposal was to learn. Uh, a layer that by concatenating the key and the query, okay, we would train a neural network that in at the output it would generate the attention score. So we would learn the parameters in this case of here there's a one set of parameters. It is this will be a multilayer perception, and here there's another clear perception that it's solving a regression task. Because the output is a continuous value, the attention score, and that's that, would, that was the scheme that you put in the, your computational graph, and you would back propagation, you would allow allow uh, these weights to be learned. If you look at the formulation of this layer perception, so there's one and two layers. I am not putting biases here actually, and. Uh, this with the first layer, okay. Uh, the, this first work that's from 2015, okay. That's this, this paper from Yosho Benjo and Kim Chu Cho, Dimitri Dana, okay. All these legends on RNNs and attention. Um, they propose this architecture, so one set of weights and another set of weights, and the other was the attention. Yeah. Do you, do you see the mapping between the equation and the figure? That's one of the goals of this course. That, so when you see one equation like this, you don't get scared and you understand what's going on there. Okay, so this is a vector, but it's it's a concatenation. So I concatenate the query and the key. So the, the key and the query. This W1 are this set of weights. And then the app, oh, sorry, then there's a nonlinearity. They use a tangent hyperbolic, so values between one and zero. And then on top, they train a new set of uh, parameters. In this case, a vector because the output was one, and that's what that's what they put in the model to be trained. So they they learn the w one w two during training. Um, this this type of attention mechanism it's called additive because you when here I present it as a concatenation, but you can think also that uh, this equivalent to having um, so this this scheme could be decomposed as an addition of two different um, 
different uh, set of weights, WQ and WK. WK will be for the, that's the weights that affect the key and WQ, the weights that affect Q. Okay, and in that case, we would combine it with an addition. Yeah, and actually this, this gets closer to what we are going to see later. You, you see that uh, later in the transformer, what we have is a set of weights that modify the query and a set of weights that modify or that are associated to the, to the query. Okay, another approach, which is uh, simpler, is uh, let's discard the tangent hyperbolic, okay? Layer, so we don't put any nonlinearity there, and then we only we only have let's see the W matrix. Uh, we can, if we do that, we can think that the the attention between the query and the key, it's uh, the product of the projection of the query, that would be this part, and the projection of the key. And if we if we put the matrix in the right dimensions, they will they will be of the same size, so we will be able to compute the the product. Fine. And if we go, okay, and if we go a bit farther, but it's I think just here and it's kind of simplifying or just it's 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 the same, okay. But when they, when you read multiplicative attention, normally there's a W, it's weights are explicitly explicitly assigned. When we talk about dot product, normally you already uh, have the project the projection of the queries and the keys. So if, if instead if instead of just really formulating everything, I already consider the result of this product, the result of, the, of this product, then you say that it's a the dot product attention. But it's kind of the same, okay? depending if you consider that there's a projection matrix or not. Then there is a small modification to this dot product, which is the scale dot product which is the attention that is used in the transformer that's coming later. That basically, you, we did a dot product, but there's a normalization factor, which is the square root of the uh, dimensionality of, of the decoder states. And it was seen in the transformer, you see here the reference, that by doing this normalization factor, that helped in the whole training process. That's the most popular Attention. So you you will normally when you see formulas for attention, you will always see the square root of the h dividing there. That's what it means. The normalization part. Good. Um, now I have a question for you. Okay. Here you have a uh, four options, and one of them is correct. And the question is the following. So first, uh, consider that uh, this function g f h h is not here, but you already you will already know what it is. Are the projections of uh, the query key or value okay? And these are the parameters that when we train you know, neural networks with attention, we will be estimating these projections. And later after projections, we do the top product. And that's how we're going to compute the attention scores. Okay. Then the question is: consider the product attention. How are the attention scores A, I, J, J, J between each pair of input tokens X, Y, and X, J computed? Okay, so here there's something a bit strange on this question for what for what you have seen so far. But if you detect it, you raise your hand and then I will explain, but I want to first try to detect what is a little bit strange. It's, it's correct, but it's a bit strange from the question. Do you see anything weird in the question that you have not seen? Yes. The attention scores are calculated between the very young and the representation of the mathematical Oh, right? okay. Or I, I guess it's that's partially correct, I think. I, I, I think that your answer goes in the right direction, okay. but we can formulate it better, okay? okay. I, I, I interpret okay, that for you what is weird is um, um, that in, in the, not my slide, I was comparing uh, 
case of the RNN at the decoding, so at the output, with one of the, what is it of the RNN doing the input. While in this question, I am asking you to compare uh, tokens, let's say, which are X and X, so they are both input, and here, I wrote inputs. I wrote inputs here. Maybe I should, refer, I should remove the input, maybe. Um, so when we, so in a transformers and attention-based sequences, we can always, we can also uh, compare attention of sequences with respect to themselves. That called self attention, it's coming soon, okay? But for the sake of, of this exercise, you can assume that if you want, if you, you can think that it's input and output, never mind. And now let's focus on the four options, okay? Uh, so the question is, how are the attention scores computed here? Um, only one of them is correct. Which one do you think is correct? The first one. But it's, it's the, the then. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Attention score, yes. Yeah, first one. Yeah, sorry, sorry. It's my fault. Yeah. I'm not sure if the slides are correct. Yeah, the slides are wrong. It don't work. Because I noticed this the other day. I will just change it. Yeah. Um, so why not the one with the softmax? Because I mentioned before that we should use the soft, the softmax. Is the are the weights right? Why not? Why not the answer with the softmax? I think I, I would change the the formulation as well to make it because the problem is that I move this exercise from another slide. I would change it. Okay. I would call it from the input token and input and output out token why why change this changing okay input token okay. and now the correct one is is right now that's more Okay, wait, we're not the one with the soft marks. So it's a very small detail. Why didn't you say the one with the soft marks? Oh, because the soft marks computes the attention distribution and the attention scores. Yeah, so here, here remember, very super great memory, uh, that um, the slides I, I define as, yeah, as attention scores, the scores before the soft marks. Okay, so the soft marks is here. After the softmax, I call it attention distribution. That's super minor detail. Okay, so at this point, there, so attention scores, there's no softmax. Attention distribution, yes, there is a softmax. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, one more example. Yeah. Um, let's look at a simple example here in which we have, uh, we want to train a new network that, um, given a sequence of triangles and triangular and square pulses, it should, uh, equalize, so average their height, heights. Okay. So if in the input we have this sequence, uh, it should, if there are triangles, it should in the end average the two heights of the triangles. If there are squares, it should average the, the heights of the squares. So, so the total output should be this one. Well, the, the total, for this input, we would expect this output. Yeah. So what we can do is we can generate a, a training data set. We can of triangles which has different shapes, at, that would be the input of the sequence, and the output sequence would be the triangles and the squares and everything with the average heights. So if you try to solve the task with uh, a homogeneous neural network, so you, you have the sequences, you have only a single homogeneous neural network that you have here defined. It's one, two, three, four, five commercial layers and a these are the, the results that you would 
of chain, you can see that uh, in orange, you have the outputs. And okay, there are some, as you can see the quadratic forces, they are kind of, they don't really respect much the, the, the shape, okay? Um, here did, did a, a bad job, right? In trying to average the, the heights of both. So it's not able to, to deal with that. Piece. So actually here, when, when it's predicting the output of the triangles, it should focus on the triangles. And when it's predicting the output of the square, it should focus on, on the squares only. So it should learn you know, the, the patterns. If we add attention, okay, here the code is far more complex, but you can later check it out here, okay? You can see that now again in orange are the are the the pulses, and you can see that now they are much better uh, average. Never mind the combination of of the triangles and pulses. Okay, so that that kind of helps that attention. Uh, it's a good option to to deal with these cases, and also even more more visual. We can visualize the attention score. So we can see uh, where in the input sequence is the network focusing when predicting the output, the output value. So here, very small, this is the triangle, okay? In this, in this, at this time, you have the triangles. These times you have the squares for this example. And you can see how, uh, I don't know what's input, what's output. Not sure, but anyway, what it's what it's what it's true is that when uh, we are predicting triangles, it's focusing on the triangles. It's not focusing on the on the squares, and vice versa, right? When it's predicting squares, I guess it must be like this. It's, I guess it's the same as we had before: input and output, right? That the the attention is mostly on the square. When it's predicting this square, the attention is mostly predicted focus on, on both squares. Yeah. Another study case to finish, it's a study case of image captioning. So the, the task of image caption is given an image, produce a sequence of words that describe that image. So imagine that we have an uh, image. Uh, we are going to encode this image with a new network. So we have a representation that is compact. And this can be the, the, the starting point, the starting token for a, an RNN, for example, to start predicting the words, like a bird flying flower. Okay. Not sure if you have ever seen this before, maybe not. But that's one of the, again, one of the papers that we Udo Almino is very, very popular, okay? Um, because he was one of the, of the first words that uh, successfully dealt with by uh, generating captionings from images. So it was one of the first words that com was combining uh, images and language in the same architecture. Okay, if we do this, if we just, do, do we don't apply attention when we predict the outputs, um, the outputs will, will be conditioned the same way by the whole image. But we would like to somehow uh, have the image in such a manner that we can have a set of representations to attend to and try to decompose the image in tokens, more or less, so that we can compute attention scores for each of these tokens or for each of these parts of the image. Yeah, what we what what Uriol Vinyas and company did was okay. So uh, remember, that this is a convolutional network on images. But they divided the image in, in a grid. Here I draw nine by nine. I don't know how many how many cells they had in their paper. Okay, but the example there's nine by nine. So in that in this case, uh, we can consider that this um, nine by nine. If we just go across all of them, so. So we have the, the convolutional neural network, and in, at some stage of this convolutional neural network, I kind of divide it. So that results in, into nine embeddings. So this this length corresponds to the depth of the tensor. These are the spatial dimensions of the image. This will be the depth of the tensor, the number of channels. The number of channels, in this case, will be four. In this example, 
is the, is the size of this embedding. Yeah, this is called pixel embeddings. That's super popular now because nowadays people are trying to do things with transformers and the way to put the fit the image into the transformer is through pixel embeddings. They normally you first have some convolution on your networks to reduce the spatial dimension, and then you do this kind of split in a grid, then you have different embeddings for each portion of the image. Yeah. Then if these are the pixel embeddings and we want to do image captioning with attention, what we are going to do, so we have nine in this case. First, we need a context, ve context vector. Remember the context vector is the output of the, of the coding part of the attention after the softmax and after doing the average sum of all, in this case, pixel embeddings. Okay. As now in this setup, now we will start decoding. Um, we don't have we don't have any attention score from before. We we are starting because this is the first token. Okay, in the first token, we know nothing, and um, so we start with just the first context vector. You can see that we provide the same weight to all the embeddings. Fine. So that will be the average. The first context vector is the average of all the embeddings, but it, but it's one. It's only one single uh, embedding. In this case, it would be of okay. That's the realistic of dimension four. It would be the average of all of them. In this case, then let's start decoding. In order to decode text, we fit this special token to say okay, start decoding. So now now we have the average of all the pixel embeddings and the token start. We fit that into the RNN. This HO means the hidden state of the RNN. We print the word, okay, whatever, the, a, uh, there, okay. And now we also predict the attention weights in this setup. Then this attention, so now with this painted word, we can predict the attention weights for our pixel embeddings. We weight the pixel embeddings with the attention that we obtain after the start. So we have a new, uh, set of so now we have the attention weight we have a new representation the context vector and the context vector will in the end uh, help producing a new word and the new word also a new set of attention distribution sorry and so on we just keep iterating yeah if we look at the results that they it's, just, it's a different paper but very similar um that's the kind of outputs that they were producing it's not they are super super clear but at least one observation for sure is that the attention uh maps matrices and i'm overlapping the attention sorry here i'm overlapping or they are overlapping the attention matrices with a gaussian filtering to make it nicer okay because probably the, the attentions are we should see kind of a grid okay because it's the grid is very small and they make it large for the image to overlay so they put some gaussian probably to make it nicer if we can see that they change that the attention weights distribution is changing which is already interesting they observe that the quality of the captions was better with this mechanism which is the important thing and sometimes you can also even see some interesting correlation that when says man focus on, on this part of the man, which is skateboard, it really focuses quite a lot in the part of the, of the skateboard street, more or less, okay? There are many more examples if you click in, the, in this URL. There are a few more over here. For example, a woman is throwing a Frisbee when it produces Frisbee, captioning, it focuses on this part, that's where the Frisbee is. A dog, okay, the dog is here, standing on a hardwood floor. So the, the image refers to the word that it's underlined, okay? So a stop sign, okay? This is nice one, I like it. The jerk is standing in a forest with trees, so when it produces trees, it's really seems that it's attending to the trees, not to the giraffe. So people sitting, sitting on a boat in the water, a little girl sitting on a bed with a teddy bear. Double bit, so if you wanna learn more, 
in what is lecture by a trace from DeepMind. Oops. Uh, you have uh, two labs from this week, I think, from Xavier Besson from Singapore about uh, language modeling, modeling with transformers and sequence to sequence with transformers. And also this one from Francois Fleury from FFL from two days ago, I think, or from yesterday. But I didn't have time to look at it, but you can, he's preparing new slides to explain attention. So you can check them out. And if you have devices for him, to be happy to know that you know about his work. Okay. Some tutorials, and that would be it. I will stop the recording now.